Hi, we're back once again with this LED strip light and thinking back to the video on this where I found what the fault was, I don't really feel like I answered the original question which is why do they keep failing and someone, uh, actually a few people did point out that the LED which had failed on this LED strip was at the end it also potentially didn't have as much heat sinking as the rest of these LEDs. There's a bit of copper between each of these LEDs and that last one didn't have the same amount of copper on the other side with it being the last LED on the strip. Although this one is right at the end, it does actually have some thermal heat sinking via means of these wire leads that are connected pretty much closely to it. So there is actually heat sinking on this side, but that one at the other end doesn't get quite so much heat sinking. But it got me thinking, is there anything on this LED driver board that could actually result in a failure whereby we get no light from the LEDs whatsoever? Now obviously things like the fuse can blow and then it was no longer work. But things like capacitors, which we'd normally associate with um, going faulty over time in LED drivers and power supplies, may not have that same detrimental effect with this particular design. So this is the data sheet for the LED driver we've got on this board. It's the SIC9552A, which I think is the lowest power device out of the lot. And it's just a plain buck regulator. Because we don't need the isolation in this design, it's a fully enclosed LED strip light. There's no chance of someone coming into contact with the LEDs. We don't need any isolation. So there's no more complex uh, flyback or any other kind of converter design. It's just a plain buck regulator. So we've got, um, this schematic pretty much represents what we've got on the PCB. So we've got an AC supply being rectified by a bridge rectifier, so full wave rectified. Then we've got an electrolytic capacitor which smooths the AC waveform so we have much more of a DC waveform coming out. And then we've got the driver chip itself which is fed through this resistor. Now the driver has a shunt regulator built in so basically Internally it clamps VDD for around, uh, around 7 volts and as long as you keep the power dissipation in that clamping diode low enough then this quite happily operates. So basically you can just operate it with a series resistor and then they put a capacitor here just to provide a bit of smoothing on that line so that even if this is rippling, which I think it will do given the load of these LEDs, this should provide much more of a smooth DC into VDD. Then we've got another capacitor up here across the LEDs and we saw this in the ring light um, driver design. This is designed to reduce the ripple current in these LEDs so you don't see quite so much flicker. And then we've got the inductor, uh, flyback diode and then the sense resistors. Now out of all of these parts we're really not going to see the inductor going open circuit. We're probably not going to see a failure in the diode. These resistors will also be fine but the ones that we're likely to see failure on is these two electrolytic capacitors and I think this would still probably quite happily operate even if we got rid of these two capacitors. We'd see a bit more ripple in the LEDs if we get rid of this one and if we get rid of this one I think we will see at least some flashing at 50 hertz or 100 hertz because it's full wave rectified but I think we'll still get light output so what I want to do today is just explore removing these components and see what actually happens. So I've just put a current clamp on one of the leads to the LEDs and if we look at the waveform we're not getting a huge amount of noise here, we're not seeing too much ripple so that capacitor across the LEDs is doing a fairly good job of eliminating some of the ripple on these LEDs. So first of all let's simulate a failure of that capacitor by just removing it from the PCB. That's now been removed from the PCB as you can see so let's power it up and see what happens. And so that all looks to be working completely normally. Um, I can't see any flicker by eye, I certainly can't see any flicker on the camera and it's still got the same kind of intensity so even if that capacitor was failing you probably wouldn't even know. However if you look at the waveform you can see we're getting a lot more noise going on here. So this is the current ripple into those LEDs which is fairly high in magnitude. Ignore the scale because uh, I haven't set it up properly for this current clamp but we're seeing a lot more noise here compared to the fairly smooth DC that we saw before. And while that isn't a problem for the LEDs themselves and for the application, what it is doing is it's radiating all of the switching frequency along this nice big antenna. We're getting nice currents at 50 to 100 kilohertz, so it's making loads of noise for uh, radio frequency type stuff. You would hear that on an AM radio, for example, and that is not good. So this 
wouldn't even probably pass EMC emissions given the current ripple that we're seeing here. But clearly, if that capacitor dried up and failed through um, high temperature or long time in service, we wouldn't even know that that capacitor had failed. It would still illuminate and everything still looks normal. So I think the next step is to remove the other electrolytic capacitor. Now this is the electrolytic that's directly after the bridge rectifier. So this will get rid of all of our smoothing at 50 um, hertz, well actually at 100 hertz because we've got a full bridge rectifier. So I think what we might see once we remove this capacitor is the LEDs flickering at 100 hertz. The controller should still power up because it has its own small capacitor to keep that DC level smooth. But let's see what happens. Right, so as you can see, the LEDs are still illuminating just fine. There's a little bit of flicker. If I wave my hand in front of it, I can kind of see um, the strobing effect. But the LEDs are still illuminating, potentially a little bit dimmer than before. I can look at these LEDs now, whereas before, um, you know, they were so intense that I could barely look at them. But if we look at the waveform, you can see we've got quite a different affair going on here. So we've got all of the switching noise while it's operating, but we've got this dead time in the middle. Let me just stop the waveform. This is going to be our zero crossing point on the AC waveform. Hopefully you can see my cursor. But basically there's going to be some dead time now. Because we've got no storage of energy, there is a point on the AC waveform where there's not enough forward voltage for these LEDs to illuminate. So they're actually not on at this stage. And then this is where they start turning on again. So they're only coming on for that top sort of peak of the AC waveform where there's enough voltage to have them all turned on. But really, you can see that even if all of these um, components start to fail, we'd still get light coming out. So what that's saying to me is it's very unlikely that on my previous LED strip lights that blew up, it was anything to do with this LED driver. It's very unlikely that the inductors or the driver chip, unless it saw a transient um, which I would have thought all of them would have seen the same transient and blown in the same way, unless the driver is different. But unless the fuse has gone, then it's pretty much certain that all of those other lights that I had previously had faulty LEDs as well. Now, in some previous videos, I had some comments asking why I don't use so many Chinese LEDs, particularly on the LED ring light. I think that prompted a few comments. There's plenty of high-power Chinese LEDs out there from brands you've probably never heard of, and they are a fraction of the cost of the Cree LEDs that I used on that design. However, I've had quite a few issues with those in the past. And I've had issues, in fact, right across the board with quite a few different Chinese LEDs. Red, amber, yellow tend to be fine. In the past, I've had a whole load of green and blue LEDs fail. Uh, in just a standard 5mm package, they worked fine and then they just started flickering and dying and I had pretty much 100% failure across the board and it meant loads of rework and that kind of put me off those. Then those LED strips that you can buy, the adhesive strips with white LEDs, what I always find with those is they work fine and then about a year on, if you look at them, they've sort of gone a yellowy colour and they're given a very dull yellow output. I've got some which I've had on sort of 24 hours a day for about three years now in the utility room and they're basically yellow now they're not outputting anywhere near the nice white light that we've had before and if you look at other videos I think uh, Julian Illett had a video ages ago of his LED strip lights in his kitchen they all failed um, and it just seems to be particularly with white LEDs you're opening up two different modes of failure now the strip lights that I've got uh, the LED strips that I have in the utility room they are obviously degrading the phosphor. That's why the colour shift is occurring. But with white LEDs, you've got the phosphor to worry about, and then you've got the diode, which could also fail. And, you know, rather than cheap out and have to keep replacing LEDs, I rather just prefer to use um, proper branded products in the first place. And I've never had a failure of Cree LEDs or Nitya LEDs or LumiLEDs or Kingbright LEDs. They always just seem to work forever. So I tend to stick with those wherever possible. Now, um, obviously things like um, the LED clock that I made, th there's not really a lot of alternative. You do have to use those WS2812 LEDs, which may be prone to failure. I have got some WS2812s that have failed in the past, so we may see that, um, but there's not a lot you can do about that. Those don't get made by the other brands, but where possible, I tend to use the higher quality ones. So just something to think about when you're trying to design something, 
it may be worth just spending that extra bit of money if you want it to last longer. So hopefully that answered a few questions there. I really don't think there's uh, much else that can fail on this board other than LEDs unless there's a transient and this fuse blows. So um, I think that's fairly conclusive. So maybe we'll see some more strip lights in the future. Check the failure mode is the same. But I think that's pretty much answered my original question. So hopefully you found the video useful. If you've got any thoughts or comments, leave them in the comments section down below. Again, thank you to JLCPCB for sponsoring these videos. And until next time, thanks for watching.